Hi everyone, my name is Johan and I'm a product manager here on Jira Service Management and I'm here to talk about service for every team. I'm going to cover a quick few slides on service management for non-IT teams. Then I'm going to jump into a demo and I'm going to show you how you can partner with these teams to co-create a service desk together. And then to wrap things up and put them all in perspective, we're going to chat with Ronnie Nesterovsky. He's the global service delivery manager from Breville, a company I really love and we're going to talk about the impact they saw from expanding beyond IT. Sounding good. OK, so right off the bat, I want you all to make sure we start this on the right foot. I want to talk about three very common scenarios, and I want to get you thinking about what this looks like at your company. The reason for this is because service management is not an abstract concept. It's obviously not rocket science. It's just how teams support each other in day-to-day -day business operations. So let's dive into the first example. Imagine you're tasked with hiring a new team member at your company. Now, it sounds simple, but obviously, it's not necessarily that simple. First of all, you need approval from the business to bring in a new hire, which can sometimes be a bit of a hurdle in itself. After that, you'll need to liaise with recruitment to get the job ad posted. You have to conduct the phone screens, hold interviews, and after that, offer a contract. And once they sign it, at that point, yes, you're good to go. But wait, there's more. You have to coordinate with facilities, IT, HR, and all the other teams to make sure that your new hire is ready to start on that first day. From software to hardware, from access to the systems, to a desk to sit at. So when this process works seamlessly, it's like magic. It's like walking to Hogwarts where everything just works. And when it doesn't, it's a little bit like a scene from The Office where you know, everyone's trying their darndest, but um, it's getting a little bit orcs. So, Let's shift our focus to maybe a less complex, but still a very important scenario. You're preparing for an external presentation. All you need is approval from brand and legal, and then you're all set to present and close the deal. Awesome. But this seemingly simple process can often become difficult. Consider this. Who gives the approval? And if you know that, do you even know how to contact those people? And once you figure that out, are you confident they'll even prioritize your request for a review? And what if they give you that approval at 5 p.m. the day before your presentation? At this point, you're getting a whole bunch of extra work, working late into the night at the worst time possible. A huge amount of stress. Oof. Or a situation that you're probably all pretty familiar with right now. How do you book international travel for, say, like a conference like this one? You don't need to obviously book the hotels, get the relevant approvals. You have to figure out how to expense your meals. Now, when all this stuff works, you're bragging to your friends about the perks of your job. Good times. And when it doesn't, you're staying up at night worried that maybe you'll get stiff for the bill because you chose to book the hotel that doesn't have bed bugs. Ugh, a bit yeeks. What I want to say today is that all of these things are services. They're not necessarily IT services, but they are services nonetheless. And services are important. And most departments provide services to the business, whether they are IT or not, and whether they realize it or not. So service management is that not-so-secret source that helps companies to provide excellent employee support efficiently. So service management adds structure to the chaos. Without service management, you might have teams that are getting bombarded with requests, emails, Slack messages, phone calls, WhatsApp messages, apologetic visits to their desk, scrunched up balls of paper thrown at their heads. We've all been there. There's an element of hyperbole in these last examples, of course, so that doesn't make the message untrue. Requests are slipping, people are overwhelmed, and management isn't happy. So service management adds structure to that chaos. So which teams are we talking about? Well, we can divide teams into technical and non-technical teams. Technical teams, like IT and DevOps, are certainly very used to using tools to enable collaboration and service delivery. The reason why they do this is because they do technical, complex work and they service teams across the entire business. You don't need to follow a system, obviously. You don't need to use any tools. But that would make it really, really hard for these teams to get things done. In that same spirit, as software continues to consume the world, all teams now do highly complex technical work and need to collaborate with more and more departments. That's just the world we live in. HR, for example, now work with highly complex HR information systems in collaboration with IT. Marketing, do highly targeted emails and in-product messaging based on machine learning algorithms in collaboration with analytics and data science, who in turn have to work with IT and data engineering 
It's a rich tapestry. And in the world of hybrid working, where you don't actually know whether the people you're working with are even in the same city as you, let alone in the same building, it's never been harder to find the right supporting teams. So service management is essential for all teams, not just the technical ones. So service management is a system that ensures that value is delivered. The team doesn't let requests fall through the cracks because everything is a ticket. Team leads can use automation to prioritize and assign tickets so their priority reflects the value of the service delivered to the business. And leadership can see the great work they're doing, so now the team gets recognition. And that's the difference between a team that is overwhelmed, overworked, and underappreciated, and a team that's kicking goals and can actually sleep at night, which is important. So I want to turn my attention to all of you folks here. I'm imagining that the reason why you're here is that you're passionate about service management and have some expertise in it. And I'm here to tell you that that expertise is something you can use to enable this at your company. You already know, for example, how to define a service catalog and express them as request types in an end user facing portal in a way that makes sense to the person seeking help, while still making sure you get all the information you need for them to be able to get the job done. That's not super straightforward, that's a skill. You also know how to set SLAs sensibly to drive accountability and reports that give the business a meaningful view of the work the team is doing. You also know how to transform processes into workflows without adding unnecessary admin overhead to the team. And you know how to use tools like automation to drive efficiency and a knowledge base to drive deflection. So your colleagues can obviously learn this stuff on their own, but I'm here to tell you that if you partner with them, they'll learn it much faster. So here's one way that you can engage and approach that partnership. So the thinking here is that you come in, you provide support, and you give them some space to go and run with some ideas, and you essentially teach them how to fish rather than doing the fishing for them. The first step is to understand what services the team offers, how they work, how they measure success. And after that, it's not so much, and just to clarify, it's not so much about you getting all that information from them, but rather you asking those questions and getting them reflecting about what they do and what this means for their service desk. After this, you can take some time to co-create the service desk with them. You really want to take some time to set the course for them and get them used to using Jira service management. And I'm going to walk you through what this looks like in a little bit more detail. But it's essentially an iterative process, but they're ideally able to self-serve and play with the tool themselves. And next, book in some time to check in. It's very easy for people to lose momentum or get stuck in a local maximum. So this is where you can help unblock them. If they're getting stuck, you pick them up. And if they just need help getting things to the next level, this is where you can step in. And after that, it's just a matter of launching. And this is not anything crazy, it's stuff that might be second nature to you, but things like, let's say, um, office hours, training sessions for your team, internal comms, uh, meetings with key stakeholders, maybe a launch party, this is stuff they may not be aware of. So this is where you can step in and you don't have to do any of this stuff. All you have to do is make sure that you're around and you can be a trusted advisor to help them on their way. Cool, so I want to get into a demo. I wanted to do the, the demo live, um, but unfortunately um, that would have been highly risk prone, but I want to make this feel as real and, as the product experience possibly could be. So imagine, I'm going to go through two demos. The first will be for HR, and we're going to look at HR with a company managed project. With this, um, we're going to have my imaginary friend up here. Um, his name is Bob, and Bob in HR, is, um, he's very, very keen to get a service desk up and running for his team. So the first thing I do is I'm going to create a company managed project. I'm going to select the blank project template because it has that request type builder. The HR service desk template is still awesome, but I want to show that off for you just so you can see some of the new functionality. Edwin showed you that a little bit before if you saw the keynote. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select the channel axis and I'm going to set it to be restricted. The reason why I'm doing that is because Bob needs to be able to play with the service desk and I don't want someone to accidentally find this um, service desk and start asking for help. That would be a little bit embarrassing and awkward for him. So we go through here and I go through the next step. Now here, we're going to start creating our request types. So at this point, I'm going to say, hey, Bob, come down, sit down. We're going to put him in front of the same laptop and we're going to have a bit of a play. So um, we have 52 request type templates available out of the box with, for every single service desk. So you have them right now. I encourage you to have a bit of a play with them. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit down with him and say, OK, 
I know, Bob, you mentioned that in our conversation last week that you need employee onboarding, employee offboarding. Let's have a look at what we got here. Um, I'll get him to jump on the laptop. I'll get him to play with this a little bit. For example, he can just jump in and start playing with the fields here. These things are interactive. It gives him a sense of what this is going to look like to his end users. Nice. Um, he puts a bit of information in. And after that, we, boom, we create it. Nice. Let's do the same thing for employee offboarding. Go through. And at this point, by going through this whole process, we're going to go into our project for the very first time, and we've already got two request types configured. And that took absolutely no effort whatsoever. We're now going to go in and edit our request types. And if you looked at those request type templates we have, we don't have one for a leave request, and we'll probably make one soon. However, um, we can't cater to every single possible request type. Like, for example, I might be a big Bon Jovi fan and want to have a Bon Jovi-related service desk in Spanish. So what we have here, and this is soon going to be available to everyone who has access to Atlassian intelligence, I can put in a request that says, well, I can just put in, in whatever language I want, yo quiero un service desk para un concierto de Bon Jovi, and um, we get some options here. And all of these options are in the language I solicited them for. And um, it's pretty cool. Unfortunately, at this point, um, uh, Bob is getting a little bit impatient with me. He just wants HR. So, OK, sorry, Bob, calm down, calm your farm. Um, and you can see that we're getting some HR request types here. I'm going to select the leave request. And I simply set it up and create it. Now, this is a new feature. We're still working on it. We're working towards adding some fields here. So at some point, that will be coming in the near future. I'm working on it. We have the developer in the audience right now, Rashi. Big shout out to you. And um, with this, we could simply add some custom fields, of course. But the thing is, I want Bob to be able to sort this out for himself. I don't want Bob to have to come to me and say, hey, can you create a custom field? Or, hey, there's a custom field that's not available in this project. Can you add it? I mean, I can do that, but I want Bob to own this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on Add Form. And by adding a form, I have access to 217 form templates. And if I go through them, you can see I have a massive variety of um, form templates available. And I do have a leave request one. And once again, we can have a look at it. We can have a bit of a play. You can see that there's some awesome conditional sections, which I'll show Bob very soon. And all I have to do is attach it, save changes, and we're done. Boom. Um, and this experience here, where you can just click here and add forms, that's something that's coming in the next few months. So keep your eyes peeled. At this point, I'm going to look at the workflow. Because I know that for a leave request, you need an approval, right? You can't just put a leave request through and have someone just say, yes, done, the end. So we're going to go here and have a look at the workflow available or associated with this request type. And to do in progress done, not so bad. But I mean, where's the approval? This is not quite going to work. So I'm going to click here, and I'm going to click on Replace Using Template. This is available right now. You can use this right now. If you want to jump on your phone and configure it, jump on your laptop, have a look. And I can go through, and we have 36 workflow templates that are available. And I can click through. I can go through all the different departments that we have um, workflows for. And HR request with approval, that's probably the one I want. I jump in and say, Bob, what do you think? Bob has a bit of a click around. He has a bit of a play with it. And Bob's pretty happy. I don't know if you can see him. Maybe it's because of a figure of my imagination. But anyway, he's looking pretty happy with this. So we're going to give it a name that makes a bit more sense. We'll call it a leave request workflow. I'm going to create a leave request issue type for it. And boom, it's done. And that was just, what, maybe five clicks or so. And in the back end, I've created a new issue type. I've created a new workflow. I've updated the workflow scheme. I've updated the issue type scheme for the project. And I've changed the, request, the issue type that this request site maps to. But I didn't really need to think about it. It was all very quickly done behind the scenes for me. So that means that when I'm talking to Bob, I can just do this stuff. I don't have to go back to him maybe a half an hour later. So it makes it nice and fast. And now you can see that that workflow is associated with the project. Cool. At this point, I'm going to walk Bob through how Jira Service Management works. So I'm going to click on the form, and I'm going to walk him through it. And you can see that with forms, um, I can change the leave request type. And you can see that the form actually dynamically updates. And this is a really good way to make sure that your end users don't have to go through a whole bunch of redundant sections that aren't relevant to them. You can make it super efficient using forms. And the other thing that's really good about forms is Bob has complete freedom to modify this form as he sees fits. He doesn't need to be a Jira admin. Being a project admin, he has 
basically the keys to the castle when it comes to forms. Because I don't want to make him a Jira admin. He'll come in, he'll, he'll do things he's not really comfortable doing. This gives a certain level of guardrails and autonomy with alignment. Okay, so um, I get him to fill out the form, have a bit of a play, nice. He can see what the submitted form looks like. And now I want to show him what the team will see. So I say, okay, Bob, um, when your team receives this request, they then see the issue view. And you can see there's additional fields that people in the team will see. Um, he can have a bit of a play and see how you change statuses. You can see that there's an approval needed and that we can't approve it because I'm the one that asked for leave. And unfortunately, if I ask for leave, I can't approve my own leave. That's a bit weird, right? So we have a bit of um, safeguards in there. And you can see how comments work. So I'm, I'm giving him a bit of a tour of the, of, the, of the tool. After this, I'm going to walk him through what it looks like to work with um, queues. So I show him the queues, and I can show, say, hey, this is how your team can figure out how to pick up work. We can configure these queues however you like to make sure that the things at the top are the things that are the highest priority to them. You can make separate queues for different team members. You can do whatever you want. And after that, I want to encourage him to just go out and run with it. After that, though, I want to show that, I mean, a lot of people like queues, but a lot of people prefer boards. So boards are available to every single customer of Jira Service Management right now. So once again, if, you, if you're keen to do this, you can pull out your laptop and have a look. They are available. You just have to enable them for existing projects, and all new projects have them. So we can um, set this up, and now we can see our request coming through into the board view. Awesome. Super, super cool. And after that, I want to show Bob how he can do some reporting. Because obviously, Bob's in under a lot of stress. The team is doing a lot of work, but the business doesn't really know what they're doing. So let's um, walk him through reports. Now, the challenge with what I have now is it's just one ticket. So it's kind of hard to bring this to life and get people excited about it. So I'm going to show him a different service desk that has a few more issues. And I'm going to show him some stuff that I created before. Um, so when you're having a conversation like this with Bob, it's good to be a little bit prepared. So then you can overwhelm him with stuff like this and say, hey, look at time to resolution over time. Look at created, uh, tickets created versus resolved over time. This is a nice way to showcase all the stuff your team's doing. You can show this off to your manager and you say, hey, look, my team's the best. When are we going to get our bonuses? We're having an awesome year. Um, you can say, look, Ryan Lee, what a legend. Look how much work Ryan's been doing. I told you Ryan needs that promotion. Um, same goes for Alana, you know, that kind of thing. And if you are on the Enterprise Edition, Atlassian Analytics takes this to the whole other level where you can play around with amazing visualizations like this. Um, so if you're, in, if you're keen for this kind of thing, keep an eye out. We're doing a, doing a lot of investment here, and um, there's going to be a lot of um, movement here. Anyway, I digress. So at this point, Bob and I, we've had a good chat. I've made him a project admin, and I'm just going to leave him for a couple of weeks. And if he has questions, I'll answer it. But the whole goal right now is I want him to start playing with this. I want him to start updating forms, updating queues, walking his team through it, creating some issues. And when I come back a week or two later, the goal is not so much for him to get off the ground, but rather to start looking at how we can drive efficiency. Because I want him to get as much value from the service desk as possible. So the first thing I'm going to do is I say, hey, Bob, you know how you get lots of questions about the performance review process every year, and how you always have to kind of write back and say the same thing? Well, having a knowledge base might reduce the number of questions that actually come to your team. And that's a really good way to drive efficiency. So we go to the knowledge base. We're going to set up a knowledge base for this service desk. And we're going to create some articles. Now, I could just write out an article, or I could copy and paste some stuff that we've done before. But I'm very lazy. And the last thing I want to do is sit down with Bob for 20 minutes and write an article. So, here is something that's soon going to become available to all the people who have access to Atlassian Intelligence. And that is the ability to simply say, hey, could you write an article describing the performance review process here at Harry's Hats? That's where I work. We do it twice a year. We assign ratings on a one to five scale based on manager and peer feedback. We assign bonuses based on performance, blah, 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 blah. Maybe fill in the gaps. And boom, we have a knowledge base article. And that took me all of maybe, I don't know, 10 seconds, pretty easy. And so I just insert it. I can make some edits. And then boom, anytime someone says, ask HR, and they say, hey, I'd like to know about the performance review process, we got it here. Nice. After that, I say, well, hey, we can't deflect every request. Sometimes people will just ask questions. And you'll have to give them the same responses again and again and again. 
So what, one thing we can do is we can create some hand responses. These are templatized responses that make it nice and easy. And um, what we do is we click on this, we'll create one, and maybe every time someone just says, hey, I have a question about blah, and they just press submit, we say, hey, thanks for your question. Really appreciate it. Could you please provide a little bit more information? And we're good to go. And after that, you simply insert the response, and boom, you're ready to go. And at this point, I'm going to say, hey, so in addition to creating some knowledge-based articles, Bob, why don't you go ahead and create some canned responses? But the one thing that's kind of annoying me at this point when I'm talking to Bob is I'm noticing that this assign to me thing is empty because this ticket is actually not assigned to anyone. And we can obviously go through and assign every issue that comes in, but that's kind of, like I said, I'm lazy. I don't want the team doing that. I don't want to do that. So let's use some automation to make it that this stuff just automatically happens. So we have an automation rule where we can say when an issue is created, let's automatically assign it to a team member. When I click on that, you can see on the top left, this rule is automatically generated. Now we can go ahead and we can customize this and make it that there's very, very complex logic. It, can be, it goes to tier one support of this, tier two of that, whatever. We can do things like that. But right now with Bob, we're going to start simple and I'm just going to turn this on and this rule is now in effect. Every time a uh, ticket is created and comes into the team, it will then become visible to, uh, it will then be assigned to someone in the team automatically based on how, much, how many tickets they have. After that, we can maybe do another one quickly. When a customer comments on a closed request, let's reopen it. They might be annoyed. We don't want people getting angry at us. Okay, cool. Pull this in, turn it on, done. At this point, Bob's getting a little agitated, and I can sense this. Uh, I, I can see there's something on his mind, and it's because he saw this thing, which has changed the security level for confidential HR cases, and it really triggers him. He starts sweating, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, Bob, what's going on? He's like, well, look, you've got this whole service test for me, but people give us really, like, complicated things that are confidential, all right? Like, he doesn't want people to know he's a massive Bon Jovi fan. It's not cool anymore, for example. So he wants to make sure that not everyone can see these requests coming in. I say, okay, look, and he says, can you click on that? I say, okay, fine, I'll click on it. But we haven't actually configured this yet. What I need to do here is I actually want to go to issue security and I want to set this up. And with issue security, what issue security does is it lets you decide who can and can't see an issue. Really important for legal and especially important for HR, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to associate an issue security scheme with this project. Now, I created one of these before, but this is not very hard to do. And when you associate the scheme, after I go through and associate it, you can see the security levels I've created. So I've created a security level for assignee only, another one for the requester and the assignee. And what this means is, when I turn these on, I can say, hey, for this request here, or this issue that's come through, let's make it that not everyone can see it because it's confidential. So I'll go to my request types, I'll click on the leave request, and I'm going to search for a field called security level. Once I add that field, if I go into that request that we created before, on the top right, you can see that there's this little padlock item. When I click on that, I can then decide to lock it down so only the assignee sees it or only the requester and the assignee sees it. And I can tell Bob, hey, you can, we can create whatever you want. We can create another one for just the CEO, another one for just leadership, another one for the HR team. We can set these levels up so that we can lock things down because people obviously come up with very confidential and highly sensitive requests in HR. And this is a really good way to make sure that people don't see things they shouldn't. Awesome. So this point, it's just a matter of giving Bob over here the keys to the castle. And after that, we're ready to launch. But now I'm going to ask Bob to leave. Give him a round of applause, if you will. Thanks, Bob. Um, thank you. <laughs> and I'm going to ask for Lisa to come on the stage. So Lisa is another imaginary friend of mine. She works in marketing. And Lisa, she's a bit of a go-getter. She kind of knows what's up. She's, it's not her first rodeo. She's pretty keen to own her own um, service desk. And she her team has their own way of working. And they don't need things like issue security. They don't need things like the ability to share, like say, workflows across projects. They don't need, say, ITSM features like incident management, change management. They just need a simple service desk. So they still want canned responses, knowledge base, automation, all that stuff. And we can give that. But we're going to create a marketing service management service desk. And we're going to select a team managed project. So team managed projects are awesome for people who want to have the ability to manage their own service desks. And here, a project admin can do a lot more than they can in a company-managed project. 
what we're going to do, we're going to go through, create it as per usual, and you can immediately see that the end user experience is really very, very similar to what we saw in a company managed project. It's only when we go to uh, project settings that it gets a little bit different. And at this point, because we're working with a team managed project, I want to actually encourage Lisa to drive this meeting for me. I want her to be playing with this because it's her service desk. I'm just here to provide a bit of help. And with request types, for example, you can very easily create custom fields. And all the custom fields you create are limited to this project only. They'll appear maybe in JQL searches, but they won't be available for use in other projects. But at the same time, she wants the department field. And she knows that the department field in other company managed projects has exactly what she needs. And she doesn't want to create a duplicate. And I don't want her to create a duplicate either. Like who in, a, who in their right mind would? So we can go through and we can actually find fields from company managed projects in team managed projects. And we can just pull them in and use it. And her and, she, and um, Lisa here, as a project admin, has full access to all the company managed fields on this instance. With the exception of budget, which I have used the field configuration to hide from this project because I don't want her using it. So I can decide which fields are and aren't available. So she can just go ahead and create her own budget field. And she can set the default value to 50, just to try and encourage people to only spend 50 bucks when they make a request. Easy. And with workflows, for example, we have a very, very simple workflow editor. There's one workflow per request type. She can modify it however she wants. She can add statuses. She can add um, rules like this, which are very similar to post functions, conditions, and validators. It has a whole bunch of functionality here. And when she saves it, when she saves it, she can decide to save this workflow for other request types. So you, don't, you can still bulk edit things. Um, you just can't share them beyond this project. So it's a really good way to let Lisa do what she needs to do and for me to be able to get right out of the way. Awesome. So after this, I'd simply just walk her through how you create tickets. I'd walk her through, um, later on, knowledge base, canned responses, automation, all the usual stuff. But the best thing here is that she will be able to own this and do this the way that makes the most sense to her. Awesome. So hopefully in this talk, I've made a reasonable case that every team needs service management and that you can be the change that helps make that happen. Awesome. And now, I'd love to call on Ronnie to come onto the stage. Give him a round of applause. He's a real person, not just another imagination, a thing of imagination. <laughs> awesome. How you doing? <laughs> Very well, very well. So Ronnie Nesterowski, he is the service delivery manager at Breville Group. He's been at the company for five years, and he's been managing the end user services team and the service desk across three regions globally. And he's seen the team of the company grow from 400 people to 1,100, and his team has grown from a team of four to a team of 13. And he owns the entire Atlassian stack, as well as other stacks like Office 365, Zoom, and Slack. So let's get into some questions. All right. Well, first of all, Breville, it's a very cool company. I have a bunch of appliances from them, including like a blender and stuff. It's awesome. You're not exactly like your average company. I would like, there's a few, you have a few interesting teams and ways of working that I'd love everyone here to hear about. So working at head office at Breville, um, a couple of teams you notice, um, you, you see the products made from soup to nuts. So basically, you'll see the engineers or the industrial designers drawing mm -hmm. it all up in their CAD environment. You see the engineers putting it together. Mm -hmm. They'll walk into the model shop where they use the 3D printers or the lathes or whatever it is to, to build that component. You see the prototype get developed, and then you see um, the test kitchen or the product development kitchen mm -hmm. put that product through its paces. Um, we also see other areas like you know stress test areas that you know put these things to see if they blow up or not. Just, sorry. You have to make sure they don't blow up. That's right. Okay, before, okay. Before they get into the consumer's <laughs> house, yes. All right, all right. Very, very cool. All right. Uh, and the product development test kitchen, I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Can you just tell us what that looks so like? So it's an interesting area. The product development test kitchen, what they do is they, they take requests from engineers, marketing, whoever, mm -hmm. and um, it's, they actually have uh, world-class chefs working in their kitchen, uh -huh. and they put their product through, through its paces, um, mm -hmm. you know, cooking pizzas or bread or whatever it is. Um, just to see how, they, how the product comes out. Okay, okay. And do you ever use them to just ask for lunch, or is that <laughs> off limits? <laughs> <laughs> um, in the beginning, our, the service desk was actually quite close to that test kitchen, so the mm -hmm. smells of that, all, all that food came through to us um, and <laughs> um, led us to that area. Nice, nice. Um, and so my understanding is um, the last few years you've moved from another tool to using Jira Service Management. Can you walk us through that journey? Mm. So a number of years ago, Breville was going through its um, transformational process. Uh -huh. 
Um, we were looking to expand capability as well as expand um, in, in volume in people as well as um, acquisition of other companies. Mm -hmm. um, as a result, we were looking to move to more of a modern workplace, mm -hmm. um, moving from on-prem so, um, tools into you know, the cloud-based solutions. Um, as a result of that, um, our current tool at the time was a bit clunky and not mm -hmm. very well liked by the rest of IT. Yep. So we looked internally into our stack to see um, what we had. Um, our requirements were basically simple. We didn't want to spend um, time looking at other vendors because we'd, we'd been through them before. We've, we've got, we had countless hours of mm -hmm. um, internal experience with service management. Um, we didn't want to spend thousands of dollars looking at with consulting fees and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So we knew what we wanted and we wanted to do as much as we can ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, at the time, we already had uh, Jira, we already had Confluence, and with our free licensing in JS, and we thought, let's let's see where this takes us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it worked out pretty well. Absolutely. Nice, mm -hmm. nice. Um, so, tell us a little bit about how this team, where it's the product development kitchen, how did they start using Jira Service Management? How mm -hmm. did they, did they come and up, ask for it? How did that whole process? And what did it look like before they were using mm -hmm. this? What were they doing? So beforehand. Um, the way they would receive their requests were, you mm -hmm. know, email, Slack, Teams, knock on the window, corridor conversations, okay, okay. <laughs> all the rest of it. Um, and their manager and a couple of their stakeholders um, came to us and said, look, we want something similar to what you have with your service desk and your portal. Mm. Um, so we walked them through uh, our Jira service management instance for the service desk and mm -hmm. the rest of IT. Um, we showed them a bit of the, bit of the back end. Mm -hmm. um, we showed them how the workflows worked, how the re requests worked, how the portal worked. Mm -hmm. um, and few of the dashboards as well, give them a feel for what they can do with it. Um, but they didn't need anything that complex, just something a bit more simple and sort of clicked with them. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of when the, the penny, starts, penny starts to drop. That's right. Um, and what's, what, what happens after that? So after we sort of looked at JSM and thought this is the right product for them, mm -hmm. um, initially we, we had our conversation with our Tam Dipti and, and made sure that it was fit for, fit for purpose, the product. Um, created their spun up around Jira project in our Jira board. and. Um, work with their stakeholders to start get it, gathering the requirements and then build a POC out for them. Proof yeah. of concept. Proof of concept. Yep. So um, what do you do with that proof of concept? So once, once we have a basic proof of concept with the team, um, we sit with the stakeholders, um, get them to play with it, get them to use it, run requests, run their... Um, and they usually come back with, with suggestions of, you know, we need a drop menu here, we mm -hmm. need a, you know, radio buttons there, yeah. um, you know, change the flow here, whatever it is. Yeah, so it kind of helps you align. Mm. And it sounds like, um, what's the difference between that meeting and say just you discussing it and showing them the back end? Um, does, it, does it seem like at that point that's when the penny really drops and they really get, it really clicks? Or? Yeah, it does click, but then once you do the simple pop for them and they start playing with it, I think there's a bit of skin in the game there and, that, and they, yeah. it takes them forward. Mm -hmm, mm. Mm -hmm. And then um, what happens after that? After that, um, we iterate a few times until they're happy. Mm -hmm. um, we generally will have a training session with some of those stakeholders, mm -hmm. um, get them skilled up, especially around the administration for the project itself. Mm -hmm. um, then they'll take over their own communications, they'll release it themselves, they'll let their stakeholders know this is their new tool for receiving requests and off they go. So it kind of snowballs and develops some momentum at that point, they're running with it. That's right. So when it comes to launching it, you just let them take care of it. That's right. Nice, yeah. nice. And our service desk will accept any other requests to do any more iterations if they find anything, but they generally run it themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I also heard that there was a pricing team that also started using Jira Service Management. Mm -hmm. That's right. So part of the marketing team, um, they needed a way to uh, adjust prices in certain mm -hmm. regions. Um, all the, their requ requirements were quite simple. They just mm -hmm. needed a a workflow to get approvals. Yeah. Um, they had to ensure that if they requested pricing changes in certain regions, it didn't interfere with promotions or anything else that was going on in that, in that area. So we, once again, we sat with them, created the POC, um, found who the approvers were, added them in, showed them what they need to do. Mm -hmm. And um, very simple process, um, hit the regions, they hit the approve button, whether it was email or mm -hmm. in the actual portal, and off they went. Lovely. And so it sounds like the process you went through in terms of getting them, taking them on that mm. journey was pretty consistent across both cases. That's right. So. It's always requirements gathering, do a bit of a POC, get them using it, get them comfortable and mm -hmm. move on. Yep, yep, lovely. And um, what would be your advice to the, to the folks here who are looking at maybe using Jira Service Management for teams beyond IT? I think one important part is you want to do as much as you can internally. 
Um, and I think we found that the service desk, there's always a few people on the service desk that have an interest mm -hmm. um, that will skill themselves up and, mm -hmm. and assist with um, development. Um, that's always a good, play, good, um, good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, Another another thing, another worthwhile thing doing is finding finding those power users mm. in the in this with the stakeholders who you can sort of um, train up a little bit around the admin side of their own project, mm. as well as them understanding where um, the, the capabilities, so they can come mm. to you with, with improvements for it. Yeah, and are those are the people that really advocate then for That's it within right. their teams. Awesome, mm. awesome, cool. And um, what was the impact then? So they have these teams. They went through this whole process. They used to be just getting requests from pretty much anywhere, and now they have this structure. What was the outcome for the business and for them as a team? A lot of them want the same thing as the service desk want. They want single point of contact. They want a uh -huh. way to track their, their issues or their uh -huh. requests. Um, the general impact was, I mean, corridor conversations are always going to happen, uh -huh. but at least there was a way to get those requirements quickly in mm. the forms that they designed and gain some efficiencies out of that. Mm. That's interesting, yeah, because a lot of the time people talk about corridor conversations as a, a bad thing. But so long as there's a bit of structure behind it, hmm. it can sometimes feel a lot less, a lot nicer than just, hey, no, nah, leave a ticket. That's <laughs> so right. I can, I can imagine that being culturally a lot nicer. And the test kitchen always gets a knock on the window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. especially when there's like maybe some nice smells coming out the door. That's right. Um, and so, what's next? What are some um, exciting things um, that are planned in the horizon? So we're also working with a couple of other departments now. We're, we're, mm -hmm. we're working with a model shop, so they wanted a way to look at how they can get requests to develop um, models in um, the 3D printers or the actual model shop itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, same thing for them, people knock on the glass saying, you know, I need this component developed quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the way for them to gain their requests. So that one's in POC mode at the moment, we're still working mm -hmm. with them. And we're also talking with another department around um, prototypes. So that department needs to know where the prototypes are, who's got them, how long they've got them for, whether they've mm -hmm. taken them home, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, obviously, that I want them to end up on Facebook Marketplace, right? So, <laughs> and just to make sure, you're talking about you have 3D printers, and people can just put in a request and say, "Hey, yeah, I not yet. That one's still <laughs> proof still of concept, coming. so we're still oh, yeah, coming, yeah. but that's the requirements." Wow. Yeah. And then you have, yes, obviously these prototypes, yeah. and the last thing you want is people not knowing who has what, who's asked for what, and then all of a sudden, yes, you might have people going a little bit rogue and and maybe um, giving early birthday presents to people that they shouldn't be. That's right.